My God. My God. The butchery makes you wish it could be unimaginable. Second ball run. Antietam. Fredericksburg. Chancellorsville. Gettysburg. And all the slaughter before and since and in between. Only knowing that it would go on and on and on forces you to reckon with it, to stare it full in the face and try to find some, some fortifying purpose in it. Some undiscovered source of strength to see it through to a just end. In a few weeks now, I will go to Gettysburg to consecrate the dead to that purpose. And I'm at an utter loss for what to say. My God. <laughs> Here I am, known to my friends as an uncertain agnostic, <laughs> appealing to the divine for relief from this hellish war. Well, it is a measure of my extremity and the nations. Moments like this bring me back to that Sunday last March when I went to Dumbarton Church to hear my good friend, Bishop Simpson, give a sermon. The first after the church was restored to service from being a hospital for the wounded. Yes, I did weep that Sunday in that place. And the memory of it still leaves me in some disquiet. The good bishop's demons with this world war are as well my own. But he wrestled with them memorably. They raised the larger questions about this war. Questions I'd as soon be quit of this Sabbath day on which even the Almighty himself is supposed to be taking rest. But the stench of putrefaction from the wagons streaming in from the battlefields even now reminds me that this is a day of rest only for some. What in God's name is all this butchery for? Those beardless Boys, take it out of that church last winter, broken, legless, unmanned. What purchase for their amputated youth and what for the amputated lives of their elder brothers, the husbands, the fathers? Was it really to redeem finally after more than three generations of slavery, the Founding Fathers' vision of a republic under which all God's children are deemed to be created equal and endowed by their creator with inalienable rights to life 
liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Or is all this suffering and destruction for a more modest aim, more attainable perhaps, albeit more provisional, that being the restoration and continuation of a union until such time as the Founders' vision could become the law of the land for all Americans, living and unborn. My friend Matthew and his flock at Dumbarton that Sunday seemed to know the answers to these questions. I wish I could be as certain. There have been times when I could not be sure whose side God's on. Is the Almighty that both sides pray to before a battle the same God? A God who would suffer, even bring to pass this grinding up of cousins and brothers in this monstrous engine of extermination. Time was when I knew what this war required. However, the slavery question needed to be settled, I would have tried to settle it to preserve the Union. Without Union, without a whole, singular foundation for our democratic enterprise, we would only be risking its early end. The Founding Fathers were right that divided the separate states would simply become pawns for the contentions of the great powers of Europe. And once admit secession as a legitimate instrument of governance, no government on earth could peaceably stop the dividing. And throughout that dividing and after, the suspicions, the fears, the animosities that would persist and rekindle both between the disunited states and within them, and the, the people ultimately could have no durable assurance of any rights at all. And yet, and yet, is all this bloodshed simply the price for our republic's safekeeping? Did 23,000 Federals lay down their lives at Gettysburg just to bind a fractious confederacy of slaveholders to the Union against their will? And at Fort Wagner last July, those scores of Negro infantrymen from the 54th Massachusetts, now moldering nameless in the South Carolina dunes, did they give their last full measure of devotion simply to preserve this union? No. No. No! No.
Bishop Simpson and Brother Douglas and the stories of countless of our Negro brethren, slave and free, convince me of nothing if not that our men are fighting and dying for more than that. We must have both union and emancipation. The two are intertwined. For we cannot have full emancipation in any of the Confederate states if we cannot reunite all of them back to the Union. And in this Union, where one of every seven of our countrymen is a piece of chattel property to be bought and sold away from kith and kin at the whim of some craven master. Such a union can command neither the blessing of heaven nor the fidelity of the righteous here below. Lord knows I am not a believer at heart but I must with the very fiber, to the very fiber of my being, believe this, that this war, our war, is now God's war too. If I cannot believe this, I cannot go on. Yet, for better or worse, I fear it is our nation's blessing and its curse that it must look to some God-given purpose to find its way. The hopes of all suffering humanity in our glimmering beacon of democracy and the hopes of millions of our enslaved countrymen in a new birth of freedom rest on our conviction that we can see and do God's will for the sake of a good larger than our own. I cannot now think on it, but God help us if ever our vision or our dedication fails. And already I'm one to say, as fail, surely someday it must. Well, maybe so. But as St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Sufficient unto the day are the evils thereof. There will be time when those days come for us to deal with our failures and the evils they set in train. But for now, the evils before us are clear. And so, I suppose I do owe the good bishop a debt of gratitude for all the disquiet he has caused me these many months. He's wont to twit me that I could never make a true believer because I can't, I never think I can afford to hope. He's right, of course. I've made my way trading on others' hopes.
but if I do not have hope to see me through to the end of this grim business, I now at least can have clarity of purpose. That purpose and that clarity, my friend Matthew Simpson and Frederick Douglass and so many of our suffering Negro brethren have given me in ample measure Yes. Yes. And now, to the tasks at hand.